Tonight, I have the pleasure of introducing a longtime friend. I've heard him speak many times and I've been enthralled each and every time. Don Wilding really needs no introduction. <laughs> And thank you, everybody, and welcome. Thank you for coming tonight. Um, <clears throat> I'm here tonight to tell you a story of uh, probably the worst winter storm, at least, ever hit Cape Cod. Uh, 125 years ago, this November, November 26th and, and 27th, 1898. That was a night to try men's souls. It was a night when the strongest of men trembled and when women wept. It was a night that should witness deeds of human bravery. It was a night of agony and of death. It was a night when the Coast Guardsman was remembered. Those were the words in the Boston Sunday Post in December of 1898, describing the Portland Gale. To give you an idea of how devastating this storm was along the eastern seaboard, and particularly here on Cape Cod. During fiscal year 1897, there were 394 disasters nationwide. These are shipwreck ship disasters. During the Portland Gale storm, there were 187 wrecks alone, just in a period of a couple of days. These were the, some of the headlines that were on, on the newspapers on the days following the Portland Gale, the mighty Portland Gale, as many have called it. Um, and it was a story that broke slowly in the press. It didn't just, wasn't hitting the papers the next day. This took several days because of many things that were going on. Uh, the graphic story of the awful disaster, the all-day search for bodies from the Portland, 38 of them washed ashore here on Cape Cod, 99 lives, and there were actually many more afterwards. The sub-headline that says, Steamship dashed to pieces on the rocky shore of Cape Cod, tells me that that editor was probably <laughs> never visiting Cape Cod. <laughs> <laughs> but the Portland Gale, it was one of those storms that was, it was, uh, it set the bar. And nowadays, it's the blizzard of 78 that everybody says, oh, nothing, that storm was something, but nothing like the blizzard. That's how they talked about the Portland Gale back in the day. There were many old timers, said Douglas H. Shepard. He was the keeper at Wood End during the Portland Gale. 30 years later, he said that there's many old timers left who are still willing and eager to settle down and begin their story. And it was in 98 when the Portland went down. 456 lives lost in that storm. <clears throat> 192 aboard the Portland. Wow. And it's named, the storm's named after the steamer Portland, but when the storm came here, uh, it was, as it was moving up the eastern seaboard uh, and from the Midwest, there was that calm calm before the storm. There was a surfman down in Chatham, his name was Ben Eldridge. He recalled that he was outside doing some washing. He was with the life-saving service. He said, I looked across the bay and there was this queer blue light over everything. The men were quiet. They weren't joking and even the gulls were around the flats. They weren't screaming. So the steamship Portland, this beautiful, luxurious steamer, in Boston, everybody knew it. It was almost, it almost had celebrity type status. And it was heading for its namesake city in Maine, uh, from Boston. This was Thanksgiving weekend. So there were a lot of people traveling between the two cities, uh, particularly leaving Boston, going back to Maine. There was also the Bay State, which was supposed to be leaving Portland for Boston. These two sh vessels uh, ran back and forth as a regular on a regular routine. This is the inside of the Portland. It gives you an idea of how beautiful it was 
inside. And it's now referred to, a lot of people have referred to it over the years as the Titanic of New England. This gives you an idea of the path the Portland was supposed to take and what it ended up doing. This was from the, uh, this map was from one of the newspapers uh, following the disaster. And originally they thought it had wrecked right off here, of, off of Cape Cod, off of Highland, uh, which later on proved not to be the case, but it did drift out this way. So it left Boston 7 p.m. on the night of November, Saturday, November 26th. Heading up the long Salem, and then as it then it started to curve out to sea, and it went down over Stellwagen Bank actually. But this shows where it ended up going. Uh, the weather reports. This was the this was a big thing uh, with the whole thing with the Portland because when the Portland was leaving, a lot of people blamed the captain. And thinking that, oh, he's not, he's disobeying orders and all that other stuff. But it turned out with the weather report that was coming in, there was, they knew there was going to be severe weather. There was no question about that. Captain Hollis Blanchard, the captain of the Portland, was, uh, had the warnings. He knew there was bad weather coming. There were two systems out there. There was one coming in from the Midwest. Another one was coming up the coast. What they probably did not know was how severe this was going to be. It ended up being what they call nowadays bombogenesis. Uh, boom, you get two storms that collide off the coast and all hell breaks loose. Um, they were never, they also never really wanted to cancel a passage of the, of the, of the Portland because not only were they having all this uh, they had all these passenger fares, they were competing with the main railroad, they were also had freight delivery. They were carrying freight as well. So they didn't want to lose any of this business. So Blanchard was thinking, well, I can beat the storm to Portland. Uh, and the weather report he had received said, you know, had, that, had those two storms coming in, but not to the severity that it ended up being. Blanchard was a regular visitor to the Weather Bureau in Boston. And, and in fact, he was called out a lot by his superiors for being too careful. And yet they were telling the papers afterwards, oh, well, it's his fault. He left, he went against orders and sailed. We told him not to sail. And a lot of people said afterwards, they asked peers of his and uh, other captains, they said he would never do that. Um, he probably took the chance because he felt pressured. You know, he was being too careful. And what he was going into, nobody expected. Even the Weather Bureau, I don't think, expected uh, the level of this storm to be what it was. The Cape Verde Highland Light recorded a wind gust of 90 miles an hour. There were actually gusts even higher than that. Joshua James, the keeper at the Point Allerton Station in Hull, estimated that visibility was a hundred yards at best out at sea because they had to, uh, he was extremely busy during this storm uh, rescuing people out at sea. Within two hours of the Portland sailing from Boston, the snow began very shortly after that. Nearly 200 vessels from Casco Bay in Maine to Martha's Vineyard were scrambling for a safe harbor. And the Portland, as it's heading up the coast, this big steamer full of almost 200 people. Uh, the theory is it was swept across the bay. Nobody really knows because no one survived to tell the story. A lot of people thought maybe Blanchard was trying to reach Provincetown Harbor. He couldn't get back to shore. It would have been too dangerous along the North Shore. A lot of people thought maybe if he steered out to sea, he could avoid any kind of... Uh, beaching himself and then maybe getting to Provincetown Harbor, but the winds kind of made that task very difficult as well. And by Sunday morning, there were reports of the Portland that it may have been spotted off of Cape Cod. Uh, daybreak on the 27th, Captain Sam Fisher at the Race Point Life Saving Service Station. He heard from very close offshore uh, 
four bells and whistle blasts. And immediately he thought, this is, this is the Portland. This, this is how well people knew the Portland. Um, he couldn't really see it, though. There was actually a break in the storm at this point. But still, there was so much mist and everything else, uh, and s snow squalls in between, and he couldn't really see what was going on. And then the, the blasts, uh, anything faded. And he had a crew ready to go to rescue them, uh, but he, he wasn't able to really spot anything. There was also a fishing boat called the Ruth M. Martin, uh, Michael Hogan as captain. They were struggling off of Cape Cod that night, trying to get back to Provincetown. And Hogan said he and his crew saw a large uh, side-wheeled steamer. And they thought, too, oh, this is maybe to Portland. And they said they actually spotted this ship for a couple of hours before the weather got really severe again. And then there was the story of the three-masted schooner Mary A. Tyler that was coming from Maine, headed to New York. And I'll have more on this later, but uh, its captain, Alan Bragg, uh, was having his own problems. And his ship ended up, the Mary Tyler ended up splitting in half in Cape Cod Bay. Uh, but later on, he survived, and he told his daughter uh, many years later that he passed so close to the Portland that he could have touched it, but he couldn't give any help. So this gives you an idea of what it might have looked like inside the Portland as it was taking on water, because a lot of people think it was probably in lost power, it was starting to break apart, because these, these waves that the Portland was facing uh, were some people th had theories that the waves were higher than the Portland's smokestacks. We're talking about 60 feet. And so the ship was taking on water very quickly. Um, and 7.30 that night, a surfman from the Race Point Station discovers a life preserver with these same markings on it, steamer Portland, uh, while he was on patrol on the beach. That turned up, and then within the next few hours, a lot more debris from the Portland starts coming ashore. 2.20 a.m. on the morning of November 28th, they found the first body of uh, Serpent Gideon Valley of the High Head Life Saving Station in Truro. Finds a body on the beach. Shortly after that, Cajon Hollow, one, um, one of the crew members of Portland, is recovered the body of a crew member, and over the next few hours, more bodies start washing up. 38 bodies total along Cape Cod's outer beach. And a lot of those bodies came ashore here at Nauset. Uh, Alice, Alice Lowe wrote in Nauset on Cape Cod, tales are still being told of the carting of bodies to the railroad station, of distressed relatives waiting anxiously in the Cape Towns for their loved ones to be released from the angry seas. The outlines of the vessels had been glimpsed offshore during the storm, known to have been lost, and wreckage littering the beach for the return of each tide. Any bodies that had watches on them, there, the watches all had the time frame of between 9.15 or so to 10 o'clock. So was it Sunday morning, or was it later on? Most people think it was Sunday morning that this happened. So this probably happened all at once that the ship finally went down. This is a list that I actually found downstairs here at the Schoolhouse Museum. A list of all the people that were found here in East Ham. Many of these people, and that totals up to uh, nine people. Many of those people were from Maine. There were many more that were found in Orleans and Chatham, that's where a lot of the, the currents took these bodies from the ship uh, that were, was over Stellwagen Bank. There's a theory that many, many of the bodies, too, were taken by the current and down into um, Nantucket Sound as well. There was a fellow who wrote to me after I wrote a column about this for the Cape Cod back in 2015. He said that my great grandmother talked about the Portland when I was young and talked about the bodies that they found on the beach in East Ham and that the funeral home on Bridge Road was full and the ground was frozen, so they kept a lot of the bodies in the barn uh, 
right nearby. And then there was a story, and I found this here too, uh, about how a, uh, a body was found on the beach by a surfman, and he went up to that body, turned it over, it was alive. Oh. That's how the story goes now. The story was, was that he turned him over, and the, and the man looked up and said, for God's sake, don't leave me, because the surfman was turning to go get help. And he panicked and did run to get help. He came back, the guy was dead. Aww. So, now whether he could have survived this, being in the surf, in the cold ocean, from Snellwagon Bank all the way to East Ham, the guy was a good swimmer. But, to survive that long, in that, those conditions, without you know, hypothermia setting in, is, is pretty long. Uh, so I, you know, I'm not sure about the uh, how true that story could be, but there it is in black and white. So anyway, to the uh, Portland itself, did they find it? Well, actually, yeah, go back a long way. March of 1899, only a few months after the disaster, there was a fishing schooner called the Maud S. The Maud S had actually seen the Portland off the North Shore on that fateful night of November 26th. And then it was out over Stellwagen Bank and pulled up parts of wreckage. And this was a, this was a newspaper article. And they, uh, they determined that yes, these pictures did indeed come from the Portland. A lot of people seem to have forgotten about that over the years. Uh, you had Edward Rose Snow looking for the Portland for many years. Wrote all kinds of books about it, but his searches turned out to be empty. Uh, he did start an organization that, uh, of uh, relatives of the Portland victims, would come uh, here to Cape Cod every year. There is a plaque at Highland Light that's still there to this day. Uh, but as the relatives all passed on, the, the entire process of, uh, of them coming to Cape Cod stopped. The vessel was finally located in 1989 in 460 feet of water in the Stellwagen Bank National Marine Sanctuary. Keep in mind that word, National Marine Sanctuary. It's federal, federally protected. You cannot go there. Uh, you cannot dive into anything that's there. Uh, plus, 460 feet is pretty dangerous for any kind of a diver. Uh, this group was led by the shipwreck hunters John Fish and H. Arnold Carr of Bourne. And uh, they had located where it was. And then in 2002, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration and the Klein Sonar Associates of New Hampshire took images of the Portland. So they did find the Portland uh, down there. They took images. There were things on, scattered around on deck. They didn't find any uh, remain, human remains. It's believed that there are many probably below, uh, below, the, below the deck of the Portland. So, what happened here on Cape Cod with this horrible storm? Well, this affected everybody here on the Cape knew about the Portland pretty quickly. The rest of the world took a little longer to get the word out. Provincetown um, was, uh, in the case of Provincetown, uh, a young woman recalled this. She wrote this for a composition many years ago. And she said that men who had vessels which were expected to be unfit for further use as they were being driven ashore were crying. Women who had relatives out at sea were weeping. Children were crying for fear of being washed away. And some of the surfmen that were, the, the surfmen were busy night and day, days after the storm. One of the uh, surf crews that was very busy was the one at Wood End in Provincetown, uh, led by its keeper, Isaac Fisher. They took 10 hours to reach two stranded vessels that were out in Provincetown Harbor in the West End. Now this is the same area that the Pilgrims had landed back in 1620. 
This was also uh, in the West End there, near the pro where the province town inn is now. The breakwater wasn't there. So this was 1898, the breakwater didn't come along until 1911. So a lot of the ships were being tossed around. There were three dozen ships that were being tossed around in Provincetown Harbor. And this crew had to reach the vessels Lester A. Lewis and Jordan Mott. And they had to pull a surfboat through snow and sand. They had to do it that way because they could not put it on a cart. If they put it on a cart, then the wind would have blown it over. So that's how severe the conditions were. And they also had to go walk through a 50 foot wide channel of water that was up to here. Uh, it made things pretty difficult. And there were five man crews on each one of these ships. And six of the 10 men were frozen by the time the wood end serpent got to them. They were frozen to death. Um, And the surf had reached almost to the back door of the Wood End Station. So they finally get to these two, the Mott and the Lester Lewis. The Mott was sunk to the upper works. The captain and the ship's cabin boy were nearly dead. Their, camp, their companions had been beating them to keep them from freezing. That was the description given. The captain's father uh, was already dead. His body was encrusted with snow. They got four survivors off of that ship. The Lester Lewis was, uh, had only its deck house and masts above water. Four men in the rigging showed absolutely no signs of life. And this is what they would do in shipwrecks a lot of the time if they were submerged or partially submerged. They would have to take to the rigging and hope for that somebody would come along and help them out. Uh, <clears throat> later on, uh, after this, these men were, the four men were rescued, the, uh, they were starting to remove the bodies from the rigging later on after the storm calmed down. And a woman that was identified only as Mrs. Henry Spears, she watched from her windows near the harbor while these men were cutting down the bodies, the frozen bodies out of the Mott's rigging. And from that time on, she kept the shades drawn on those windows facing the harbor. She refused to look out there. Meanwhile, back on the back shore of Provincetown, uh, there was the Albert L. Butler, a schooner that was, uh, that ran aground, as they like to say, in shipwreck lore, uh, along the Pecan Hill Bars. The Pecan Hill Bars are these sections of sandbars off of Provincetown. They can extend out as far as a mile. And it's, and they're constantly shifting and changing too. So it, even if you do can see where you're going, it can be very difficult. And in a storm like that, you're, you're, uh, you're really in trouble. The butler was carrying uh, logwood from Jamaica to Boston, and it got driven about 50 to 100 feet offshore. So the life-saving service is on the scene pretty quickly from out there, Pika Hill Station. They use what they call the breaches boom. Have any of you ever seen the demonstrations that they do up in Provincetown? Uh, it's a cannon that fires a projectile in a very long line out to the uh, ship in distress. And they fired the shot. One man on board grabs it. And he doesn't know what to do with it. So he just grabs the line and jumps in the water. He doesn't know he's supposed to step into this pants that are on the end of it and tie the thing up so that he can just get a nice ride across. No, he goes in the water and then he makes it. A couple of other guys try it, they don't make it. A 20-foot wave takes them out. So they don't they don't get there. So finally, after a while, the tides light up and everything, and door to the cabin opens. There's smoke coming out of the chimney. Two guys pop out of there. They'd been in the cabin the whole time. And so if they just waited in the cabin, they would have been okay. So these two men come out, and one of them had a uh, parrot on his shoulder, as the story goes here. Uh, and the parrot was uh, supposedly had quite the salty vocabulary. <laughs> he was offering up all kinds of choice words, but he also had learned uh, quite a bit just during that storm. And he came out, and uh, one of the guys said, uh, he's, 
said, that bird was right. He says, that storm was a real humdinger. <laughs> so the uh, description of the, it, this applied to Provincetown as well, but it also happened in Martha's Vineyard. Uh, Vineyard Haven tossed like toys, describing about 50 ships that had been tossed around Vineyard Haven Harbor during this storm. Um, and it was, it was just, uh, you know, 50 coasters being thrown around the harbor. Half of them marched ashore. Ten men drowned. Uh, a British schooner was driven into the wharf near the Siemens Bethel. And there were also two lime schooners that had come from Maine. And you know what happens when lime is subjected, is hit with water, catches on fire, and ignites. That's what happened to the ships. And one of them was caught up in all this fury of being thrown around the harbor with all these other ships, and this, is, this one ship is on fire. The crew is deciding, do we burn or do we drown? Well, they, they jumped off the ship just as uh, quickly as they could onto another ship that was uh, just being thrown around. It wasn't on fire. Uh, the other lime schooner uh, burned until December 19th. That shows you how hot things got with that. But the surfmen, they were, the men worked like fiends, is what the Provincetown, uh, the Portland Daily Press reported. The sand cut their faces until they were raw and bleeding. That's what it would do when you're, you're facing that sand out on the beach and it's blowing 100 miles an hour. That's what uh, it can thwart, it can send a sharp, fine sand through the air and smothering streets that come like the strokes of a whiplash. Uh, men of the life-saving service, they were exhausted uh, by their exertions, trying to cover their, their beats. Um, there were several of these cases where uh, they were made almost nervous wrecks by the nightly contact with these disfigured uh, bodies that were being washed ashore. Because once you're in the surf for a while, uh, horrible things can happen. Uh, to abide. Ben Eldridge described it, it was a terrible week we spent. Sometimes we would just see a hand sticking up out of the sand. And <clears throat> dig it up, of course, they exposed a body. And one of the lifesaver's duties was also to transport the bodies to proper authorities for burial. And in response to a journalist's query, a serpent from the Pecan Hill in Provincetown, uh, told him gruesome details of the finds he had made and the method of carrying the dead to the station. And he was asked if it wasn't rather hard on the nerves. And he mm -hmm. says, uh, we can't think about that, you know, they're somebody's friends. The Boston Sunday Post said, nigh 300 souls were lost on that awful night. You did your best. You're the heroes of the blizzard. Some of you toiled all night alone. Some of you walked up and down wreck strewn beaches. Some manned the boats. Uh, but all our heroes. And a lot of civilians stepped up to help out as well. In Provincetown, there was Captain Robert Lavender who recruited uh, 10 other seafaring friends of his. He was a retired captain. Uh, he ended up being awarded the Congressional Medal for Bravery, along with these other men, for the rescue of a man named William Forrest from the rigging of a fishing schooner, the F.H. Smith, out in the harbor. Lavender uh, said, I know there's one of us out there in the rigging, it's a life mate, so I'm going to try to get at him. I call for volunteers. So Lavender and the men dig up this old leaky whaling boat, and as they get it out into the harbor, Lavender's knocked overboard, he says, don't mind me, and they said, no, you're not going to make sure, get back in here, We're, they pulled him back on board, and people on shore are cheering, and the masts are about to topple on the smith, and they tell him, uh, let, go of the, let go and drop into the water, we'll take care of you, he drops in, and they quickly pulled him and rescued him. So to get the word out to the public, all the lines were down here on Cape Cod. There was no way to get the word back to the mainland. So the mystery of the Portland even, Portland was missing. That's all they knew back 
actually nobody really had any idea. There were some people that were starting rumors that, oh, it's safe in Provincetown Harbor. And other people were saying, no, it, it's disappeared or it's wrecked along Cape Cod. Well, there was this reporter named Charles Ward for the Herald. He was based in Chatham, and he used to give all kinds of little newsy items to the paper that they usually weren't interested in, but when he had a shipwreck story, they were very interested. And he had received a portion of a telegraph message that was going from Highland Light to Hyannis. It was about the Portland being lost. And he said, wow, he had himself a story here. So how is he going to get this to Boston? There's no faults. He gets onto what is referred to as a work train because all the other trains were out. The rails, the railroad, had been washed out in Sandwich and, and West Barnstable, also up in Truro as well. So that meant he could only get on the railroad as far as West Barnstable. So he manages on foot to somehow get to Sandwich, center of Sandwich, knocks on somebody's farmer's door and manages to borrow a horse, rides to Buzzard's Bay, catches another train to Boston, gets to Boston, he's exhausted. I mean, almost, he's ready to pass out. And he gets to his office building, and even on the train he's talking to another reporter. He didn't let on, let on at all about this story. He gets upstairs, he's still not letting on to anybody. Finally gets into the office with his editor, and he's tells him what happens, and then he passes out. Well, the editor revives him with some whiskey, and says, give me the rest of the details. He finally gets all the details. The Herald puts out this special edition at 6 o'clock that night, and about all lost, he had broken the story. Ward ended up getting paid about 500 bucks for that. That was a pretty big night for him. Uh, meanwhile, Frank Stanion of the Boston Globe, this is a few days into the following week. Another storm is on its way. Another storm is hitting. Lines are down again. Can't get, can't communicate from uh, the Cape to anywhere else. So he's trying to get in. He's got lists of names to get in. <laughs> and all the reporters, it was a media circus in Orleans. There were just, you know, there wasn't CNN or anything like that, but you had. Uh, in, in this case, just a bunch of newspaper reporters who were all hanging out at the Shattuck House in Orleans. Stanion's wondering, how am I going to get this list back to the globe? And he heads back out into the snow. He's walking up the road, and he passes by this building, and you can hear the click of a telegraph key. I think you know where he's probably hanging out. He is about at this point. Yeah, outside the French cable station. In Orleans, he hears this clicking, and he goes inside, and they're not doing a lot of business because of all the lines and the failure of the telegraph line into New York. So the superintendent there, an Englishman named Hugh Osborne, uh, says, oh, come on in. Matter of seconds, they figure out a way to uh, transmit this message. Uh, the message went from Orleans on Cape Cod to St. Pierre and Miquelon, these islands off of uh, Canada, but they're French, they're French territories. Then under the Atlantic Ocean to Brest, France. Mm -hmm. Then from <laughs> Brest to London. Then from London by British Postal Service to Ireland. Then roughly 2,500 miles to Nova Scotia and down the coast of New England back to Boston. <laughs> That's how he got his story in. So otherwise, a lot, of, uh, a lot of boats were coming from Boston. Two tow boats came to Provincetown a few days after the storm, filled with reporters. And Provincetown seemed full of them all at once. They were just looking for anybody who would talk, give them some kind of details as what was going on. They're interviewing uh, you know, any, any guy on the street who would talk, and so they could put some kind of story together. Two hotels in town, and they were filled. 
And some of the reporters hired horse and carriage teams for transportation to get around out there, uh, especially to the life saving service stations out at High Head and Pecan Hill. And some of them went into the undertaker's rooms where there's a lot of unidentified bodies. And there was this one woman in there that the Portland Daily Press reporter saw. And she was about 50 years old and had a cruel cut on her head, evidently caused by contact with a piece of wreckage while in the water after the steamer broke up. And he said that these tales were sickening and painful to listen to. We could not but shudder at the terrific tales of this horrific storm. And a lot of relatives were arriving, of Portland victims, were arriving here on the Cape by train looking for their, their kin. Some were searching for days, just going from one place in Orleans to Wealthy <laughs> to Provincetown, wherever they could maybe find. Some of them came away empty handed. Um, the railroad tracks were washed out in both Truro and Sandwich for a few days. That closed off train service, made things much more difficult. This was in Sandwich, uh, this was actually town neck between Sandwich and Sagamore. Three to four miles of track were washed out, and 300 feet of track in West Barnston. Um, it was reported by one of the Boston papers that a tidal wave, that was their words, a tidal wave, crossed the railroad track, probably just the storm sir, and covered parts of Main Street in Sandwich with three to four feet of water. Several fish houses were wrecked, one of them being stranded right on the railroad track. And Sandwich had lots of damage, churches, houses unroofed, chimneys thrown down, several barns and buildings were demolished, streets were impassable because of the falling trees, and that was of these elms and silver oaks that were lining Sandwich streets. Uh, a lot of livestock loss, uh, houses were surrounded, uh, by water, some flooded. One family was rescued by a boat. That happened in Provincetown as well. Plymouth waterfront was flooded out the high tide on November 27th. The sea surrounded Plymouth Rock. And there were other people who went to sea from Cape Cod, never came back. One of them was Captain John Garfield of West Dennis. He was pretty friendly with a guy named Captain Mark Holmes, who had also a ship. Uh, he was from Connecticut, and they were dining in Philadelphia on the night of November 24th. They frequently did this. They were both pretty, uh, they were big in the coal uh, market. They, would, they were ready to embark on another coal run to uh, New England from Philadelphia. So 96 hours after that, the two mariners were together once again only not in the manner that they had expected, or anyone else for that matter. They were lashed to the masts of their respective ships, dead at the bottom of the ocean off of Montauk Point. Garfield was 36 years old. He was the captain of the three-masted schooner James B. Pace, and a member of the Boston Marine Society. Uh, Holmes was captain of the Howard M. Hanscom. And they were, November 24th, they were both being loaded with coal, uh, Garfield and his ship were going to Boston, Holmes and the Hanscom going for Providence. They would often sail together, these two. And the fate of both ships remained a mystery for uh, quite some time. In December, the New York Maritime Register reported that the pace was overdue, following by several months of missing status. Garfield now had a wife and two children. And his first mate, named Danny Nickerson, his wife was taking care of their eight-month-old son in Dennisport. And the days and weeks passed, and any optimism for their survival was fading fast. And a year later, December of 1899, government divers who were investigating navigational obstructions at the bottom of the seas off Montauk Point discovered both ships, the Hanscom and the Pace. Uh, the details by the Maritime Register were in both vessels. The divers report that skeletons of men were found lashed to the rigging or to the rails of the vessels. And while there's nothing left of the flesh, it's thought they could be recognized by the clothing. 
Then some people actually survived. Like, as I mentioned earlier, Captain Alan Brack, who was aboard the Mary A. Tyler. You know what they say about washer shores. How many washer shores have we got in the room here? <laughs> okay? Right. Well, Brad was a wash ashore, but in a different sense, uh, because he really did wash ashore and he wasn't even a pilgrim. Or like that. Uh, the Mary Tyler was carrying paper from Maine to New York, broken to, stranded in Payne, uh, near Payne's Creek in the bay there in Bruce. Brad was a native of North Carolina, and his crew was you know, as often happened to uh, vessels that were in trouble, they went up into the masts. Well, they take to the rigging, and when the tide ebbed, they were fortunately they were rescued by Brewster Captain Jeremiah Wixon and several other men that he had recruited to help out in the cause. Uh, this was the description provided by Bragg's daughter. Uh, many years later. She said, grimly, he and his men worked to keep their own ship afloat. Just before night fell as the terrifically high and pounding waters off Cape Cod, his boat broke in two. The forecastle remaining just enough above water to allow the men to try, but in vain, to light a blaze, however small for warmth, by pouring kerosene on coal. They had a few water-soaked soda crackers, but they were too frozen and sick to eat. They tied themselves together with a rope and after hours of struggling with the wind and the icy deck managed to lash themselves to the mast. All during that frozen night of horror, the wind whipped the mast into the sea, tossing it up and down as though it were more than a splinter, freezing them to it. Their clothes were iced to their bodies, they were vomiting and nearly unconscious. The wind abated somewhat toward morning and after daybreak they were sighted from shore. Bragg told his daughter, uh, that for a long, long time the tides brought in rolls of paper from that wrecked ship and the natives of Brewster gathered, dried, and used. It was said that the, these rolls of paper produced the Brewster School newspaper for many years. <laughs> but uh, the story had somewhat of a happy ending. Several years later, in 1904, uh, Captain Bragg married Margaret Wixon. Jeremiah Wixon's daughter, his rescuer's daughter. And they lived in uh, Brewster for the rest of their lives. His uh, life at sea didn't end with the Portland Gale either. Um, during World War, World War I, he was a lieutenant commander for the Navy, led some of the largest transports of the war. During World War II, he worked for the government as a civilian in charge of a Michigan shipyard which built small boats. And he is forever remembered uh, at the Captain's Golf Course in Brewster, where he, the second hole on the starboard course is named for him. So here on the Cape, with all these bodies washing ashore, somebody had to coordinate all of this chaos that was happening and all these bodies coming to the undertaker's rooms. That was the job for the medical examiner, Dr. Samuel Davis of Orleans. Davis was uh, an untiring official, as he was described. Uh, he was, uh, his district embraces all that dreary Cape Cod shore along which every hour finds the body of another victim of the terrible storm. Uh, he was a native of, of Martha's Vineyard and had been in Orleans for 30 years. And the medical examiner that he was, he put out the word to people saying he requested photographs. He says, we need a full description, age, color of hair, eyes, whether the person wore a beard or a mustache, what shade, uh, marks upon the body, jewelry of any kind if worn, clothing, its description, a full complete description to accompany all photographs must be attached to the picture in, in some way. And he said, letters have been pouring into me since Tuesday at the rate of nearly 100 a day. This is about a week or so after the storm. The requests for information tell of the tremendous sorrow the entire New England states are weighed down under. Davis urged the authorities to move all the bodies to Boston as quickly as possible. And this created quite a hectic scene at the Orleans train station as well. 
Also in Orleans, uh, a fellow named Rufus Snow found, uh, he was a weekender at the Sand City area in Orleans. He found the Portland's big six foot double steering wheel, in fact this picture came from downstairs here, uh, and he, would, he got this wheel and the cable and everything. He later exhibited the wheel in Boston and then in Maine. I guess he was trying to capitalize, make a few bucks on it. Well, it ended up being seized by the Portland Steamship Company afterwards. It, it, they supposedly destroyed it because it hurt their business. And close things out are one of the last stories here. Uh, one of, the, one of the bodies that was found was uh, identified by a young man named Clarence Rogers in Orleans. Uh, Clarence Rogers was about 20 years old. He was out walking the beach uh, after the storm, and Nauset Beach, and he's walking down the beach. He finds the body of a young girl, well, about his age actually, about 19, 20 years old, wearing only a white nightgown and black stockings. This is more than some of the victims were wearing. Uh, he's totally stunned. He covers the body up with his coat. And then he runs back to town to the undertaker's office. And they come back quickly with the cart. Uh, Clarence rides along. And it's noted that for some strange reason, because perhaps because the victim was so near his own age, or perhaps because the discovery had been his, uh, this happening held for him a horrible fascination. And back at the undertaker's office, the officials are scrambling to learn the girl's identity, and they chose a casket. Clarence was the one who chose it. And they said, well, if that's the way you would seize it, why not? So they went with that. And then the relatives, uh, the girl's relatives, show up from me to claim the body. And they didn't like the choice of casket by Clarence, and they chose another one. And this kind of freaked him out a little bit. Um, throughout the winter, he stopped by the undertaker's office on vacation to regretfully view the casket. And then later that winter, Clarence came down with a cold that developed into pneumonia. And it wasn't long before he died. And following his death, they had to choose a casket for him. And well, they figured, well, all agreed that had been selected for him was the one he had selected for the young victim of the wreck was the most appropriate one in which to bury him. He was also reportedly laid in the tomb in the cemetery in Orleans. And uh, the days following the uh, funeral, the family dog would show up there and lie down at the tomb for several hours every day just waiting for Clarence to wake up. And then, of course, there was the poem written, The Loss of the Steamer Portland, that was written by Captain, Fr Captain Frederick Eldridge and hydrographer George Eldridge of Chatham. 326 words, it opens with the lines, On the 27th of November in the year of 98, a northeast blizzard swept the sea, death following in its wake. And that summer, this, this poem was made into a song. And it made a very impact on a visitor from New York in Chatham. His name was E.W. Blanchard, brother of Hollis Blanchard, captain of Portland. And he was staying at the Monomoy at the end. And Blanchard um, drove about town with George Eldridge. And Eldridge sang to him the song of the Portland which the Chatham Monitor said affected him very much. So back to Annie Newcomb Spaulding, who wrote this composition in Provincetown many years earlier. Uh, she summed it up, uh, the storm and what it did to the Cape, the terrible event which rested so heavily on the hearts of many and which will not soon depart. Well, I will be departing now, uh, <laughs> because this comes to a conclusion. And uh, my follow I will be doing some other events. This, kick this Portland Gale talk will be at several other places uh, in the coming weeks.